sponsored by Acrula and hosted by A1 Logics. And uh, it is uh, co sponsored by Anastasia TV. So today we are having a critical kind of update. For that, we are having two interesting topics. One is on vasopressors and inotropes by Dr. Sanis. And the fund is followed by another topic that is uh, mechanical ventilation strategy for ICU patients by T.R. Sandra Sayasar. Both the speakers uh, doesn't need any introduction because they have presented uh, that uh, topics in the previous year and it is well received, all of you know. Uh, with that introduction, I welcome uh, Dr. Suprasad sir from Madhuri Medical College to coordinate this session. Over to you, sir. Good morning, all. Uh, warm welcome on the Sunday for the session on uh, uh, online anesthesia. Today, we have two important topics, one on inotropes and vasopressors, and other is the ventilation strategies in critical care. Both these topics are just not for critical care. It is all for the whole anesthesia practice. To do these topics, we have two eminent speakers, Sanish sir and Chandrasekhar sir. Both have uh, been a long association for our online anesthesia. And so, uh, Sanishar needs no introduction. Almost whoever is a postgraduate will definitely know him. Sir is a senior consultant in Anandpuri Hospitals. And uh, he is the author of a famous book, uh, Review on Clinical Anesthesiology and Anesthesia for uh, Technicians. He is also the founder of Anesthesia Tools, the uh, YouTube channel. And uh, he also is a member of IC Academics. You all would have known his uh, videos are very famous in IC Academics. And uh, sir has uh, uh, given a lot of wonderful lectures. Uh, over to you, Sanish, sir. Uh, we are uh, eager to hear an interesting topic. Very good morning to Panandol in this uh, fine Sunday morning. I'm happy to be part of uh, online anesthesia program once again. And I thank uh, Dr. Edward Johnson, Dr. Shiva Prasad and all the organizers of this um, uh, very important academic platform continuing their effort for anesthesia and critical care update. These are my affiliations, my YouTube channel Anesthesia Tools, uh, the website uh, Online Anesthesia Tools webinar campus which gave me opportunity to work hand in hand with um, uh, people like uh, Dr. Anup uh, and of course um, Dr. Chandrasekhar and many stalwarts in the speciality of anesthesia and critical care and of course um, Indian College of Anesthesiology. I also bring greetings from Anandapuri Hospital uh, Trivandrum, Kerala. So let's begin our uh, discussion. Uh, I think we should start right from the definition of what is shock. Shock is a life-threatening, generalized state of circulatory failure resulting in the inability to deliver oxygen in peripheral tissues to meet their demands. Some clinical symptoms of shock include gold skin, increased capillary refill time more than 3 seconds and increased central to toe temperature gradient. As far as the shock patient is concerned, the earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome. It's of crucial importance to identify early the presence of the state of shock. The skin with decreased tissue perfusion, the kidneys with decreased urine output, and the brain with altered or impaired mental status give the clue and these are the most easily accessible organs and symptoms to assess and diagnose the state of shock. It is the result of one of the following four mechanisms. The first one is the decrease in the venous return due to the loss of the circulating volume as it happens in hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock. The second one is the inability of the heart to function as pump due to the loss of contractility or abnormal electrical activities such as arrhythmias, as in the case of cardiogenic shock. The third one is obstruction due to pulmonary embolism, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, etc., as in case of obstructive shock. The fourth one is the loss of vascular tone due to maldistribution of blood 
as you come across in septic shock, anaphylactic shock or neurogenic shock. Here our main priority is to maintain the hemodynamics of the patient until the cause of shock can be identified. This is mainly achieved with fluid resuscitation, inotropic and vasopressor therapy. Let's see what are water vasopressors. These are heterogeneous class of drugs with powerful and immediate hemodynamic effects that increase the tone of vascular system that is vasotonus and therefore mean arterial pressure. Restoration of adequate pressure is the criterion of their effectiveness. However, remember blood pressure is not always equivalent to blood flow. Vasopressors can be classified according to their adrenergic and non-adrenergic actions. Adrenergic agents include our dear norepinephrine, phenylephrine, epinephrine, dopamine dobutamine and isoproterenol. Non-adrenergic agents include angiotensin 2 and nitric oxide inhibitors. Many drugs have both vasopressor and inotropic effects. Inotropes are a class of drugs that change the force of the heart's contraction. They augment cardiac contractility and shift the frank sterling curve in an upward and leftward direction so that stroke work and cardiac output at any given filling pressure are increased. Although this occurs at the expense of increased myocardial oxygen consumption, severe hypotension compromises myocardial perfusion markedly. Now how do we plan our strategy? Alpha-1 adrenergic receptors are located in vascular walls and induce significant vasoconstriction. Alpha-1 adrenergic receptors are also located in the heart and can increase the duration of contraction without increasing chronotropy that is the heart rate. Beta-2 adrenergic receptors in vessels induce vasodilatation. Dopamine receptors are present in the cerebral, coronary, mesenteric and renal vascular beds. When stimulated, they induce vasodilatation. Dopamine receptor subtypes are responsible for norepinephrine release which causes vasoconstriction. Some of these drugs increase the sensitivity of the myocardial contractile apparatus to calcium leading to increase in inotropy and vasodilatation. Now let us try to organize these agents depending on their affinity towards a specific adrenergic receptors. So I have plotted the uh, alpha adrenergic sensitivity or uh, specificity on the left hand side and beta on the right and between alpha and beta together in the mid zone. Let's see epinephrine can be placed almost in the middle because it has uh, both alpha and beta adrenergic action. When it comes to phenylephrine, it goes to the extreme alpha end. Dobutamine is towards the beta end, predominantly it acts on the beta receptors. Isoproteinol is further on the beta side. Norepinephrine is more towards the alpha adrenergic receptor affinity and action. Dopamine is interesting because in lower doses, its actions are on dopamine receptors and beta adrenergic receptors and in higher doses they, it switches over to alpha adrenergic effects. It is also important to keep these fundamental principles in mind before proceeding to the discussion. Restoration of volume status is a key intervention in the management of shock. Recently the early treatment goals of uh, traumatic hypovolemic shock must have uh, changed with an emphasis on minimal intravenous fluid administration and avoidance of over resuscitation. This is especially with regard to long term mortality and morbidity. Next we discuss uh, some drugs like dopamine may involve action on different receptors. Again dose response curve may not be as predicted. The popular expectation one size fits for all is perfectly absurd in these pathological scenarios where even paradoxical responses may be seen. 
it is also important to distinguish between the direction action of the drug as well as uh, reflex action due to hemodynamic changes. Let us see how we interpret the clinical findings of shock. Say for example, hypotension could be a result of uh, vasoplegia or loss of systemic vascular resistance. It could be the result of low cardiac output or uh, stroke volume as well. When you come across a scenario of uh, inadequate systemic vascular resistance with pathological vasodilatation and compensated elevated cardiac output, we generally conventionally call it as warm shock as against cold shock with inadequate cardiac output, elevated uh, systemic vascular resistance and compensatory vasoconstriction. This is cold shock. The interesting thing is when you do fluid resuscitation, cold shock may be converted or may feel like a warm shock or as part of sepsis, when myocardial dysfunction sets in, warm shock may be uh, appearing as cold shock as well. So this distinction is very tricky. In warm shock, what happens is reduction in systemic vascular resistance. So there will be vasodilatation, palpable pulses, warm extremities, compensatory rise in cardiac output. It can lead on to preserved pulse pressure. This is what happens in distributive or vasodilatory shock. In cold shock, SVR actually increases cold clammy extremities are the clinical finding. Reduction in cardiac output will result in weak distal pulses and narrow pulse pressure. We conventionally call it cold shock as in case of hypovolemic shock or obstructive shock. Remember the key point underlying is inadequate preload. Impaired cardiac contractility results in cardiogenic shock as in case of acute myocardial infarction. Now let us try to plot our drugs in discussion today. Uh, I would like to distribute it in two different um, plots like uh, one side inotropic action and on the y-axis side uh, uh, vasopressor action. Okay. So if you look at the inotropes, you can find that there is an overlap between inotropes and uh, vasopressors. Okay, these are called inoconstrictors. Then you have inotropes without vasopressor action or even vasodilatation, they are called inodilators. Again, similarly, if you plot the vasopressors, vasopressors with inotropes already mentioned as inoconstrictor, and pure vasopressors or vasoconstrictors are also there in the spectrum. So these are the examples of inotrope plus vasopressor action like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, pure vasoconstrictors like phenylephrine, vasopressin. When you take a dobutamine or milrinone, they are inotrope but uh, with the vasodilator action, they are inodilators. And of course, a fourth class of drugs called pure vasodilators which will not form part of today's discussion examples would be nitroglycerin, nitroprusate, neseritide, etc. Now I would like to plot this in a different way where vasoconstriction to vasodilatation varies in the y-axis as shown here and inotropic action uh, as we move uh, towards right will be more positive inotropy. Now let's see where all our favorite drugs discussed now uh, will fall into. When you take norepinephrine, it has a positive anotropic action of course and it is predominantly vasoconstrictor so it is plotted there. Low dose epinephrine or dopamine, it's far more towards the positive x-axis or positive anotropy and of course a little bit of vasoconstriction also associated with it. When you look at the high dose dopamine, I mentioned more of alpha adrenergic action so the plot moves further upwards in the y-axis or vasoconstriction axis, not much forward in the inotropic uh, axis. High dose epinephrine, more inotropy but far more vasoconstriction action. 
Phenylephrine is a pure vasoconstrictor as I already mentioned and vasopressin is again uh, a good uh, vasoconstriction but uh, slightly lower compared to phenylephrine. Now I would like to see where dopamine, dobutamine falls. Dobutamine falls on the negative y axis or towards vasodilatation axis but the predominant positive inotropic action which is very important because it will improve the contractility but due to vasodilatation it can cause a reduction in SVR and drop in uh, blood pressure as well. Nitroproside of course is a pure vasodilator. Now um, uh, whatever said and done ultimately what we do in reality on the ground what uh, that's what matters that's what uh, I intend to discuss today. How do I make my choice? Conventionally this teaching is uh, you look at the receptors and uh, uh, decide which receptor to stimulate or utilize for your management and now uh, the present era we speak about the effects like we have plotted the drugs uh, on the basis of their effects like inotropy or vasoconstriction action and now we decide according to the um, data of their effects on various scenarios. How do we choose vasopressor? Our aim is to restore adequate blood pressure. Of course, I have mentioned blood pressure does not always equate to blood flow. And when you choose uh, inotrop, what's your target? To increase the cardiac output, uh, to determine where cardiac output is adequate in patients in shock is a thorny problem. But nowadays with the invasive monitors, hemodynamic AI enabled projections, it seems uh, more rational to look into those parameters and decide on your choice of drug. Okay, hypotension results in reduced perfusion pressure. It can lead to major organ damage. And there could be abnormal shunting of blood flow within organs. And you need to keep in mind the cellular alterations uh, which may lead to inability to use or delivered substrates and down regulation of adrenergic receptors is also a possibility in the pathological conditions we are about to discuss. Remember the first thing is to attach monitors, get a clinical sense, um, correct the volume status and then decide whether to use vasopressor or inotrope. Our target is to restore effective tissue perfusion and normalize cellular metabolism as it's always said try to simulate normal hemodynamics or normal physiology as far as possible until we cure the primary insult. So the decision making, which one work, in which sequence, mechanism of action, what are our goals of therapy and uh, of course you need to consider the best available clinical evidence. Nowadays we have invasive monitors as I have mentioned and uh, whether it makes more sense it requires practice and familiarity with these monitors to make best use of these uh, parameters. Let's go to a few scenarios. First scenario I would like to discuss is a scenario of a cardiogenic shock complicating myocardial infarction. Cardiogenic shock is a state of impaired end organ perfusion caused by a decrease in cardiac output despite adequate intravascular volume and is usually associated with the following hemodynamic characteristics systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury for more than 30 minutes in the absence of inotropic or vasopressor support of course a reduction in the cardiac index less than 1.8 liter per minute per meter square without support and less than 2.2 liter per minute per meter square with support and elevated left ventricular filling pressures or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure going above 18 millimeters of mercury and elevated uh, uh, left ventricular filling pressures I have already mentioned. Okay. Now this is our decision making thing, whether to use inotropes vasopressors or you have to tolerate critical hypotension. So we need to understand that inotropes and vasopressors may trigger ventricular arrhythmias and contraction brand necrosis. 
the heart is already compromised with an infarction or loss of blood supply whether our extra push on to the cardiac contractility will lead on to increase myocardial oxygen demand and infarct expansion we need to keep in mind and suppose you don't choose sinotrope vasopressors we are uh, facing critical hypotension your ventricular arrhythmias may have tolerated contraction and necrosis limitations. the heart is Further already compromised with an infarction or loss of blood supply whether our extra push on to the cardiac contractility will lead on to which increase myocardial take? oxygen demand and so infarct expansion we have to we take to a keep decision in mind. and try to augment the cardiac contractility to save this scenario uh, remember, in the shock trial, one of the most popular trials regarding cardiogenic shocks, they suggested that early revascularization in acute myocardial infarction patient like uh, CABG or percutaneous coronary intervention uh, was accompanied by lower rate of uh, mortality when compared to the initial patient medical stabilization. So this is the reason why revascularization is considered the definitive treatment of patients with shock after acute MI. The mechanical augmentation of cardiac function via intraaortic uh, blood uh, balloon pump or left ventricular assist devices should only be used as a temporary solution until definitive revascularization is uh, done. So when you are faced with a cardiogenic shock complicating myocardial infarction, the hemodynamic alteration in cardiogenic shock or decompensated heart failure are addressed with the use of uh, vasopressors and inotropes. Inotropes are used as they increase the contractility thereby increasing the cardiac output. Often this kind of agents might increase the heart rate and subsequently increase myocardial oxygen consumption. Uh, going by the society guidelines, the ACC AHA guidelines, in such a scenario, without signs and symptoms of shock, dobutamine is the preferred uh, agent of choice. And in case the blood pressure is already low and there are signs and symptoms of shock, dopamine or uh, next choice would be noradrenaline in such a scenario to maintain the perfusion pressures. Now let's try to um, make sense of it from our previous cat classification of drugs. Of course, uh, we, we know that uh, contractility is compromised, so we need to choose something from the inotropic side, right? So that's what uh, we have tried to uh, choose from, from the inotropic side on this grid here on the right side, inotrope. And uh, if no signs and symptoms uh, of shock are there, the recommendation is to go for dope. Dobutamine. Uh, you know where dobutamine is placed in our plot with vasoconstriction inotropic action. So inotropy is there. There is a little bit of reduction in the systemic vascular resistance as well. Remember, as of now, there is no signs and symptoms of shock. Now, how do we handle uh, dobutamine? Dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine that stimulates uh, beta 1 and beta 2 adrenergic receptors and has a little action on the alpha receptors. It has a potent inotropic activity with only modest chronotropic effect. It increases the stroke volume and cardiac output and lowers PCWP and SVR. Usually started as an infusion of 3 to 5 mics per kg per minute without a loading dose. And usual dose range we can go up to 5 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute. And the preparation available with us would be 50 milligram per 5 ml ampule. Now on practical side, how do we uh, dilute it? Okay, so we know that uh, one ampule or 5 ml contains 250 milligram. You dilute it uh, with to 5% dextrose or normal saline to 50 ml. Now we have 250 milligrams in uh, 50 ml. That means 5 milligram per ml. In other words, 5000 micrograms per ml. Now imagine a 50 kg patient, so how much uh, per kg, 5000 per ml divided by 50 is 100 microgram per kg per ml. Suppose you run the infusion rate at 1 ml per hour, 1 ml is uh, 100 micrograms per kg we know per hour, so 1 hour is 60 minutes. So now it comes down to 5 by 3 microgram per kg per minute, which can also be written as uh, 3 ml per hour equals 5 microgram per kilogram per minute which should be clearly labeled along with your 
uh, infusion pump syringe. It's a good practice to uh, document the date and all. Okay, so even who loaded, uh, we have to mention clearly. So we know that if uh, six ml per hour is going on, we can Im immediately understand that ten max per kg per minute is going on. Okay. Dopamine is the next drug. Uh, it's a naturally occurring neurotransmission uh, transmitter and precursor of norepinephrine. It acts on several receptors. So at lower doses, two to five max per kg per minute, uh, it stimulates dopaminergic receptors. This leads to vasodilatation in renal, mesentery, coronary, and cerebral vessels. Uh, at this dose, dopamine induces uh, natriuresis, although no definitive evidence for improvement in renal function exists with this so-called renal dose of dopamine. Intermediate doses, uh, 5 to 10 mics per kg per minute, increases the cardiac contractility and chronotropy, it increases heart rate. And this occurs directly by stimulating the beta-1 receptors and indirectly by releasing norepinephrine from synthetic nerves. Higher doses, 10 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute, it acts predominantly on alpha receptor and it results in peripheral vasoconstriction and increases SPR. If you look at the dopamine ampule available, it's uh, 200 milligrams in 5 ml ampule. And how to load it? Uh, you take uh, one ampule, uh, 200 milligram in 50 ml syringe with the diluent make up to 50 ml. So now we have 200 milligrams in 50 ml. That means 4 milligrams per ml, that is 4000 micrograms per ml. Similar calculation for 50 kg patient, 4000 microgram per ml per 50 kg, that comes down to 80 microgram per kg per ml. So if you are running at 1 ml per hour, 1 ml per, uh, is 80 microgram per kg per 60 minutes, it comes down to 4 by 3 microgram per kg per minute. So Otherwise, we can put it as dopamine. 3 ml per hour gives 4 microgram per kg per minute. Okay. Now, our next agent of choice in a cardiogenic shock is norepinephrine. It increases the systemic blood pressure, pulse pressure, peripheral vascular resistance, and stroke volume. In response to norepinephrine therapy, the cardiac output is unchanged or decreased, and there is compensatory vagal reflex that slows the heart rate. So it is widely used as the first line agent to increase blood pressure and it is preferred over dopamine in most scenarios. So recommended starting doses from 0.01 to 0.03 milligrams per kg per minute. The maximum suggested dose is 0.1 milligram per kg per minute. Now you can locate uh, where norepinephrine is uh, located in our plot of vasoconstriction versus inotropy. Little bit of inotropy but far more vasoconstricted action. It has also been shown to have uh, antithrombotic effects, especially when you are using in uh, cardiogenic shock. How about uh, high dose epinephrine? Epinephrine increases stroke volume and cardiac output and decreases SVR by stimulating beta 2 receptors in the skeletal smooth muscle. The problem is it is known to promote thrombosis of coronary vaso con uh, vasculature and exacerbate lactic acidosis. So uh, another choice in cardiogenic shock scenario is vasopressin which is very popular these days. It is shown to improve mean arterial pressure cardiac index and reduce norepinephrine dose uh, and improve coronary blood flow, uh, what is generally known as uh, catecholamine sparing effect. So these are the advantages of vasopressin in uh, cardiogenic shock as an added agent when norepinephrine is already started. Other two drugs uh, I'd like to discuss is milrinone, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that prevents the degradation of uh, cyclic AMP. In patients with heart failure, milrinone increases heart rate, stroke volume and cardiac output. It is also likely to decrease uh, mean arterial pressure SVR and left ventricular filling pressure. It improves hemodynamics acutely, however a concern exists regarding its long term safety and it has been correlated with the new onset atrial fibrillation and flutter and sustained hypotension. So this is the rationale behind the use of uh, milrinone. 
it's only for refractory cardiogenic shock the recommended doses are uh, 0.35 to 0.75 mics per kg per minute and requires renal adjustment next agent in discussion would be levosimendan it's a calcium sensitizing agent which exerts positive anotropic effect on heart by increasing the cardiac contractile apparatus sensitivity to calcium the survive randomized control trial that compared efficacy between levosimendan and dobutamin in a huge number of uh, patients revealed that levosimendan did not reduce the all cause mortality compared to dobutamin alongside manifesting more peripheral vasodilating effects than dobutamin therefore levosimendan's role in cardiogenic shock is still not clear the recommended dose is 0.05 to 0.2 mics per kg per minute and should not be administered if uh, your systemic blood pressure is less than 90 mm of mercury let's move into our favorite uh, or common scenario of uh, septic shock we usually um, anchor our discussion points based on the survival surviving sepsis campaign guidelines which uh, the latest one has come in 2021 okay it recommends uh, against uh, using q sofa compared to sirs news as a single screening tool for sepsis or shock uh, q sofa involves uh, glasgow coma scale less than 15 respiratory rate more than 22 breaths per minute and systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100 mm of mercury the easiest thing is when any of the two variables are present simultaneously the patient is considered to be q sofa positive and you can proceed with a diagnosis of uh, septic shock fluid therapy is the first line management of uh, septic shock fluid resuscitation should be initiated promptly but with caution because positive fluid balance could lead to higher mortality rates The choice of IV fluids is well discussed in surviving sepsis guidelines. Okay, uh, for adults with sepsis or septic shock, uh, this guideline recommend using crystal oids as first line of fluid for resuscitation, and they also suggest using balanced crystal oids as against uh, normal saline for resuscitation. For adults with sepsis or septic shock, they suggest using albumin. they are who have uh, in patients who have already received large volumes of crystalloids and they also recommend against using starches for resuscitation moving ahead with the surviving sepsis campaign as suggested by this uh, norepinephrine is the first vasopressor that should be administered in case of septic shock norepinephrine and its uh, veno constricting effects move blood from the veins to the circulation increasing the preload which is of clinical importance or critical importance in early stages of septic shock as it can be overfilled during fluid administration the map is a target for resuscitation because it reflects the perfusion of the vital organs map more than 65 is the resuscitation goal in the early stages of um, septic shock Vasopressin is used as a catecholamine sparing agent to reduce the levels of uh, norepinephrine dosage. Epinephrine is considered as an adjunct to norepinephrine if the MAP is not adequately increased. Inotropic support in septic shock in pa- uh, patients is used when there is evidence of myocardial dysfunction as suggested by low cardiac output, increased filling pressures and persistent hypotension despite optimal fluid resuscitation and use of vasopressors myocardial dysfunction is common uh, fact in sepsis investigators suggest a possible self protective auto regulatory hibernating myocardium dobutamine is the first line inotropic agent in septic patients as suggested by the surviving sepsis um, campaign milrinone is recommended only in patients that are uh, chronically beta blocked or with chronic heart failure whose adrenergic receptors are desensitized for adults with uh, septic shock uh, they suggest invasive monitoring as soon as uh, practical and if uh, resources are available vasopressors uh, may be started via peripheral lines to restore map rather than delaying the initiation until central venous access is uh, secured 
For adults with septic shock, an ongoing requirement of vasopressor IV corticosteroids are also suggested in the guidelines. So we have discussed about norepinephrine and uh, uh, how it is diluted for the practical purpose. Norepinephrine, if you take, uh, it's coming as 2 milligrams per 2 ml, then with diluent it becomes uh, uh, 50 ml, 2 milligrams in 50 ml, eventually it comes down to 40 micrograms per ml. I'm not going to the calculation per se, you can do the calculations leisurely as mentioned. You dilute it and keep your dilution as per the dosage requirements. Same is the case with uh, adrenaline or epinephrine. Uh, adrenaline is available as 1 mg per ml ampule. Usual uh, initial infusion rate is 1 to 2 mics per minute. Or if you want to go by per kg per minute, 0 0.02 microgram per kg per minute. Usual dose range is 5 to 15 or sometimes how they say that 5 to 20 micrograms per minute. Again the dilutions. I am not going into the details, it is the same thing. Only thing is you should have a hospital policy or protocol how to dilute and how to display the uh, mls per minute rate. Going to the uh, evidence, uh, the vast uh, the trial, vasopressin and septic shock trial showed that um, there is a marked improvement in survival with the vasopressin group but it is not significant. As you can see, the p-value is uh, not less than 0.05. Neurocritical care scenarios are very common as we deal with traumatic brain injury and acute neurological injury. The role of vasopressor has been extensively discussed in the literature. And what we actually need in traumatic brain injury to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure and uh, we need to choose an agent in this particular zone highlighted here so that we will get more of uh, increased SVR or increased perfusion to the target organ which is the cerebrum so that we can save the perilational um, areas from the secondary insult. So the literature says uh, although high quality clinical data are scarce, the available evidence suggests that norepinephrine should be considered as the vasopressor of choice when blood pressure elevation is indicated in patients with uh, acute neurological injury, especially traumatic brain injury. Now we come to vasopressin. Vasopressin is a uh, nonapeptide, uh, it's like uh, anti uh, diuretic hormone. Uh, so it is uh, synthesized to lesser degree by the heart in response to elevated cardiac wall stress and by adrenal gland in response to increased catecholamine secretion. So it causes uh, less direct coronary and cerebral vasoconstriction than catecholamines and has a neutral or inhibitory impact on cardiac output depending on the uh, dose range which is administered. The preparation available is 20 units per ml ampule. Again you can dilute in a 20 ml syringe, 20 units in 20 ml will make uh, 1 unit per ml. Okay, So the dose range is 0.01 to 0.04 units per ml. So you can start at uh, 0.6 units per hour, maybe you can go by multiples of 0.6 like 1.2, 1.8 and 2.4 units, um, units per hour. Okay. Another common scenario is a neurogenic shock which is a common cardiovascular dysfunction seen in acute stage after spinal cord injury. It is characterized by significant hypotension as well as uh, hemodynamic swings, especially bradycardia. The changes in hemodynamic profile are the result of loss of supraspinal sympathetic excitatory input to sympathetic preganglionic neurons, which are crucial for maintaining the blood pressure. The profound hypotension resulting from the neurogenic shock leads to microvascular hypoperfusion of the spinal cord itself. This vicious cycle of microcirculation affects neurological recovery rates. So vasopressor therapy depends on the level of injury and the patient's hemodynamic profile. So for injuries at the cervical level and at thoracic, higher thoracic until T6 demands vasopressor agent with both inotropic and vasoconstrictive properties 
so, uh, so that we can support the vascular tone as well as the cardiac contractility. So thus, dopamine and norepinephrine are the agents used in this specific site injury, uh, spinal cord injury site. Uh, coming to injuries in the lower thoracic and lumbar level, they warrant the need of a specific peripheral vasoconstrictor such as phenylephrine which acts only on alpha 1 receptors. Dobutamine is not used in neurogenic shock because of the peripheral vasodilatory properties and uh, the potential for reflex bradycardia in such uh, uh, cervical cord injury scenarios. Anaphylactic shock is a different scenario altogether. It's a severe life-threatening generalized or systemic hypersensitivity reaction that requires immediate and acute care. Rapid recognition of uh, anaphylaxis and prompt initiation of treatment is the cornerstone to reduce the mortality rates. The first line therapy is the intramuscular injection of epinephrine, then removal of allergen or stop administering further allergen and finally monitoring the airway, circulation, breathing and mental status. Epinephrine is the first step in anaphylaxis treatment owing to its alpha 1 agonist effects that prevents airway edema, hypotension and eventually shock along with its beta 2 agonist effects that induces bronchodilatation. Hypotension in anaphylaxis is due to dramatic shift of intravascular volume. The fundamental treatment intervention after epinephrine is aggressive IV fluid administration. Vasopressors may also need to may be needed to support the blood pressure. IV epinephrine 1 in 10,000 solution can be administered as continuous infusion especially uh, when the response to intramuscular epinephrine is poor. Intramuscular epinephrine is usually the first uh, route of administration of choice and of course you can uh, take the help of uh, noradrenaline uh, dopamine infusion in such scenarios after initiating or getting a maximal effect of epinephrine. Beta block patients or refractory shock present special challenges. You may have to use uh, glucagon for uh, inotropic effects and chronotropic effects on heart by increasing the intracellular cyclic AMP and independent of uh, which is the effect which is independent of uh, beta adrenergic receptors. Uh, this can also reverse the bronchospasm to some extent. Okay, summarizing take home points, smaller combined doses of inotropes and vasopressors may be advantageous over a single agent used at uh, maximal and higher doses. This practice helps us to avoid dose related uh, adverse effects. Looking beyond inotropes and vasopressors, we are looking at a pathology, looking at a life threatening case, so identification of the shock pathophysiology. If you have an idea about the pathophysiology, you can select your agents and plan your intervention. Fluid resuscitation most of the time is the key initial first step. So you have to fill the vascular tree before uh, initiating the vasopressor or inotrope uh, therapy. Initiation of treatment depends on the primary conditions. Targeted, lesion targeted or the primary pathology targeted interventions are going to win the day for you. So you need to think about coronary revascularization whenever it is warranted. Think about early antimicrobial therapy whenever indicated you are dealing with a septic patient. Invasive monitoring may be instituted as and when earliest, as and when it is available and whenever it is available. The access for drug administration is not a major concern. You can start with the peripheral um, administration and then move on to central venous access as and when it is ready or feasible. You need to think about mechanical circulatory assist devices like IABP in severe cardiogenic shock. And then once you are stabilized, titration or weaning off of vasopressors is also important and you need to always keep abreast with the evidence-based practice and the guidelines of our societies um, to fine-tune your therapy. So that's all um, for the time being from my side. Uh, it's time to discuss. Uh, if there are uh, any queries, I'd be happy to take query. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for giving a wide range of uh, I have groups and vasopressors usage in the particular patients. I want to say, Professor, sir. Sir, that was a very nice presentation. Very uh, the pictorial and descriptive, sir. We have not seen a presentation with that uh, syringes 
and easy way to convert drugs sir we have some questions and we can discuss sir okay. uh, first quest- question is on low dose adrenaline sir that is 0.03 to 0.05 microgram per kilogram per minute uh, uh, the question is, is does this have more beta action than high doses sir yeah uh, generally uh, low doses lower doses of epinephrine are uh, more towards the beta beta 1 and beta 2 receptors and higher doses um, the action predominantly switches over to the alpha receptors as i mentioned uh, we need not go into the nitricities of which receptor beta 1 beta 2 alpha and all ultimately you end up observing the patient seeing the parameters how your infusion works whether you have to up titrate or bring in another companion to the job for you basically you understand the pathophysiology of what exactly could be going wrong whether we need a support with the increase in svr or augment the con- cardiac contractility you go by that and rather than tolerating the side effects of the first or the initial agent try to bring in the next agent um, whenever it is deemed necessary so that's the all idea of presenting this because different drugs will be different behave uh, behave differently because it's not the same like pathological condition there are many adaptations happening at the receptors there are some down regulations there are some desensitizations all these things we have to consider so it's a practical solution okay sir uh, the next question is uh, the drug of choice for cardiogenic shock like bp7030 in a patient with rheumatic heart disease moderate mr ef and uh, con- with controlled an ef of 25% sir yeah that's a good question i think i don't know whether uh, the person who asked the question is a cardiac um, intensive care fellow or uh, consultant okay it, it's a difficult scenario okay so um, i don't have an experience with the hardcore cardiac uh, critical care uh, that's my first uh, disclaimer uh, what i believe is um, from our emergency or acute medicine point of view first you try to stabilize the patient maybe a bit of volume station or try to find out what could have uh, uh, resulted in the decompensated cardiac failure so um, understanding the scenario i am uh, i assume that our uh, the basic maneuvers like optimizing the fluid input or uh, starting a presser will not going to solve the problem we have to have an experienced cardiac intensive uh, coming in maybe we may have to uh, chip in uh, intervention cardiologist to uh, um, incorporate mechanical circulatory assist devices to save the scene so decompensated heart failure is a difficult scenario it it requires uh, expertise and uh, team work to decide what when and where to institute that's what i think because um, with only our pressor vice pressor inotrope combination you may not be able to win the scenario because it's a uh, decompensated heart uh, failure and um, our uh, drugs like melrenone um, or our um, uh, other phosphodiesterase inhibitors most of these were tried in this uh, refractory cardiogenic uh, Uh, decompensated heart failures so depends on the team's expertise and the monitoring facilities of course the deep invasive monitoring hemodynamic um, monitoring might uh, give you more ca- lights into which will be more rational choice in such a difficult scenario yes sir that is a uh, catch thing sir you, uh, invasive hemodynamic mo- monitoring only can guide us to what to do in such a situation sir Yes, we yes. can only all oral so we can only have a trial and error and what works we can uh, use it sir <coughs> the next question is is there any reason for uh, avoiding starch in sepsis sir yeah, actually uh, this time our 2021 surviving sepsis guidelines uh, they have given in detail about the fluid resuscitation and the choices they have mentioned on balanced crystalloids then on albumin and starches i think um, i have not gone into details i think the uh, follow up study has shown uh, mortality disadvantages with starches um the details i am not sure at this point of time i think the the surviving sepsis guidelines is both going through in detail um in this regard as well okay sir. in general what we see is uh, all this platelet dysfunction renal failure are all very high in uh, uh, when they are used in uh, patient with sepsis sir 
Yeah, you give me that point. For long term results also do matter. Yes, not sir. about uh, saving the hour of the day, but uh, long term. So if you have a better choice, which can give you a long term mortality, mortality benefit, then why not prefer them over the questionable uh, options? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the role of inotropes and vasopressors in trauma resuscitation, sir? Yeah, uh, trauma. I think I have mentioned like uh, the vaso. Pressors usually switches a bit of venous pooling back into the uh, central circulation, which can maintain the organ perfusion. But um, and uh, nowadays our trauma resuscitation protocol actually restrict the uh, infusion of uh, fluids in the initial hours, initial stabilizing hours. So um, connecting these two things, uh, I think um, starting vasopressor in a reasonable dose in the initial part to save the organ might translate into a better outcome. That is one thing. But uh, too much of vasopressors also will be deleterious because even otherwise there is a, a vasoconstriction if it is too much, they might end up losing the end organs. So again, it's a balanced decision. So you have to take the help of uh, lower doses of vasopressors to save the initial hours. Then you monitor and then proceed um, as and when you come across. Like uh, scenarios may be different. If it's a traumatic brain injury, it's different. It's an abdominal uh, blunt organ injury. It's a different scenario. So we can't have a one size fits for all. But it's an individualized decision. And these are broad guidelines only. Basically, we don't uh, believe in uh, over resistance these days. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is Are mildrenone and levosimendin freely available? Yes, they are available. Do they have any advantage over noradrenaline? Yeah, um, uh, actually, when I uh, actually I don't have any first-hand experience with uh, uh, these drugs, but um, uh, they have been tried out in refractory uh, heart failures, and uh, the long-term outcomes are questionable. So they don't find place as initial choices in our uh, guidelines until now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can I add one point, sir? Yes. Sir. Uh, um, usually, when the when the a problem is with the right heart, mildrenone works very well, sir. And mm. when the problem is with left heart, levosimendan works well. That is how we roughly uh, choose between uh, levosimendan and mildrenone. But both are beneficial in very short term, sir. Once the uh, other parameters are stabilized, they don't play a bigger role, sir. That is what I have seen in uh, the day-to-day -day usage, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, does phenylephrine usage warrant bradycardia? I don't know what he means by it, but uh, um, phenylephrine will not cause tachycardia, but um, you need to understand about uh, what is reflex bradycardia when you are using all these uh, hemodynamic agents. So that is one thing. Um, I don't know how to respond to uh, that query. Maybe it's not very clear. Yes, sir. Because we, we don't want uh, to uh, concentrate much on heart rate less or more when you are um, upfront dealing with a life-threatening situation. We have to maintain the vital organ perfusions. Resuscitation is our first target and uh, then depending on the scenario, you have to move forward. Because some yes. scenarios, definitely phenylephrine has an edge like in cases of um, traumatic brain injury and some of the trauma scenarios. But it cannot be extrapolated to all the scenarios. Yes, sir. Uh, one question on the difference between uh, noradrenal bitartrate and monotartrate. Are they, do they have the same uh, dosage calculations, sir? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah, the use of subclave in venous carbon dioxide PSA to gap in differentiation of cardiogenic conceptation. I think that is a different total tower. The role of me methylene blue in refractory shock, is, do you have any experience, sir? Oh no, sorry, I don't have an experience. Okay, sir. I think uh, they are in the literature, but um, I don't know whether we can take those um, messages across to our uh, routine practice. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. I think that is the end of questions, sir. Okay.
So thanks very much because uh, I have been trying to bring at a um, holistic or fundamentals, concentrate more on the fundamentals because cardiac intensive care per se is a subspeciality in itself. And uh, basically it depends on what infrastructure you have, the monitoring, your teamwork, your um, your patient in lord It's a different thing. But uh, for broad acute medicine practice and for an anesthesia audience, like how you look at this inotrope vasopressors, that's what I have tried to bring into this forum. Thank you for the opportunity. I so think definitely I'm your aim is well fulfilled, sir. Really a uh, very nice presentation, easily understandable. I think a lot of uh, first years are joining now. They should see this presentation so that they can get an insight of what should be used to wear. Very nice presentation, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank Thank you so much, sir. Start what uh, so, sir, we can move on to the next second. Yes, sir. Uh, so the next uh, session is on uh, uh, ventilation strategies in the critical care. It is taken by Dr. T. R. Chandrasekharan, sir. Uh, Chandrasekharan, sir, has done his MBBS and MD from Bangalore Medical College uh, from the year 1986 to 1992 is, is uh, MBBS and 92 to 95 is, is MD. And he has worked at PES Medical College and Research Institute. At present, he had, holds the head of department in charge of critical care medicine at unit of gastroenterology sciences and organ transplant igot in bangalore and karnataka uh, he, so our sir is well known because he took the whole lecture series on uh, ventilator uh, from the right from very basic to the advanced levels in our uh, online anesthesia last year he has a lot of publications to his hold uh, he has uh, OPC poisoning, uh, 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 still a challenging proposition. APRV in, in ALI, uh, utilizing post transition gra graft versus host disease as a tool to promoting voluntary blood transition. So many uh, nice uh, papers he has, and he has also written a textbook on mechanical ventilation and clinical applications. applications. Uh, over to you, Sir Chandrasekharan, sir. We welcome you to this online analysis session. Eagerly waiting to hear about hear your talk on. Uh, me mechanical ventilation strategies in ICU. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity. And good morning, Sanesh. A long time. And it was a good presentation. Good morning, sir. Thanks, sir. Yeah. So, uh, next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll be looking at uh, ventilation strategies for ICU patients. It's kind of a uh, topic uh, difficult to um, make it into a package of uh, 40 minutes or 30 minutes, I'll try to do my best. If there are some uh, lacunas, probably there have been uh, some recorded videos in the previous session, or we can, uh, if there are too many queries, we'll try to address it as much as possible. So, just a minute, let me screen share, okay. So, what, what do you mean by a strategy? Strategy is a set of actions to achieve a successful result. In case of mechanical ventilation, what could be those actions? The first and foremost would be diagnosis. What is the primary pathology that is causing the uh, deterioration in the patient, which has uh, warranted a mechanical ventilation? Then you look at what are the physio physiological rationale. Why I put it above uh, evidence-based medicine is because a lot of gray areas are there in uh, mechanical ventilation in uh, uh, ICU patients. So a good physiological rationale leads to a lot of a reasoning and a good care. So I put it above uh, evidence-based medicine as a physio physiological rationale and evidence-based or guidelines what we look at, what we have. And then is, as uh, Sanesh was saying, every unit has to establish a standard operating procedure for everything. Of the whole three, I would give 90% importance to diagnosis because look here, we have a patient who is a sick septic patient. We have instituted a lung protective ventilation on day one. And the day two lactate increases, the patient deteriorates. There is, if it is a COVID patient, there is increased D-dimer, CRP and ferritin, altered RFTs, and the lung has gone bad. And patient condition has deteriorated and patient dies. So do you think that a primary uh, lung protective ventilation is going to save the patient? Absolutely not. So remember this. 
primary disease kills most of the patient mortality is always because of the primary pathology so you should understand mechanical ventilation is a lung support system not a treatment for any disease it buys time and our our by instituting a lung protective or a good ventilation uh, strategies we buy time so that the primary disease is corrected corrected or controlled or whatever so that uh, uh, the 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 patient recovers management of the primary uh, disease should be the primary focus like antibiotics antivirals fluids vasopressors nutrition etc so i i want the younger uh, students to understand or the younger colleagues to understand that uh, if you don't identify the primary pathology institute the proper if it is a uh, covid uh, antiviral if it is a sepsis where is the source of sepsis what is the uh, organism other otherwise going and looking at the antibiogram of the hospital what is the empirical therapy then narrow it down to the organism that is what is going to save the patient not a good mechanical ventilation not that i'm saying that if you do don't do a good mechanical ventilation but the primary focus has to be in identifying the primary pathology so it is not a disease uh, it is a treatment to any disease mechanical ventilation however good you do is going to cause ventilator associated lung injury because ventilator is not going to set on its own so it is better to call it is a physiologist physician associated lung injury because you are going to do the settings and these are some of the points that you have to remember the base on which the mechanical ventilation is being administered today is we don't try to open the whole lung we don't try to open once we achieve a saturation of 92 we are not going to increase the peep we are not going to increase the tidal volumes so meaning we are allowing some collapse to stay we we allow some permissible atelectasis we only do partial recruitment so that the oxygen delivery is sustained to the cellular level and there is no energy failure at the cellular level that is the idea the one common uh, problem when we try to implement this kind of uh, goals of uh, saturation of anything around 90 is very very difficult to the younger colleagues especially anesthesia colleagues is because they they are always happy to see a saturation of 99 meaning they are trying to open up too much lung they are trying to open up a diseased lung so at the end of the day you don't want to have a good abg and a dead patient right so you have to reset the physiological goals or goals in your head whatever i teach i have seen the tendency to go and increase the fio2s so that the saturation is 99 there is a tendency to increase oxygen all the time because they feel that something is good if you give more it is better it's not oxygen is the the free oxygen radical is the most toxic substance that is available that can injure the mitochondria so you have to always think of energy failure and cellular energy not optimizing your pao2s see another point to understand ventilating strategies is see look at here two two patients we have 18 year old op poison non ventilator 60 year old diabetic hypertensive ihd with community with uh, acquired uh, pneumonia sepsis aka and ventilator do you think we can institute uh, or we can expect the same patients to both the patients to behave similarly definitely not so at the onset i would suggest that you always keep an eye on the comorbidities whom are you instituting mechanical ventilation to that is something that you have to understand if the second patient we know this patient has a high mortality because of the comorbidities and the problem with comorbidities some are correctable some are not correctable so there is a fixed so that leads to another question of understanding the functional capability or physiological reserve so this is what you have to understand then the another point is the whole idea of mechanical ventilation or the therapy of us is to prevent decrease in the functional capability or the physiological reserve right whatever the what is the physiological reserve or the capability functional capability of the patient at the onset of mechanical ventilation and to try to maintain at the same level which may be possible which may not be possible but that is the pursuit see once you make a understanding of this then mechanical ventilation would be much easier because mechanical ventilation should not 
impair the functional capability or decrease the physiological reserve. So that is where the prevention of uh, ventilator associated lung injury or delirium or ICU acquired weakness all come into picture. So once you understand that what is the physiological reserve or the functional capacity of the patient at the onset of the mechanical ventilation and trying to hold it there or trying to improve it from what was there is what is going to really make a difference. So these are some of the ICU stay associated problems like ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, ICU acquired weakness, delirium, uh, malnutrition, I can go on and lack of sleep, I can go, go on and on and on. But these are some of the things you have to prevent. The only thing what you can do is prevention, prevention, prevention. So understanding the primary pathology is key to devise the ventilating strategies for ICU patient. And correction of the primary pathology is the most important thing. So another way of looking at the strategies is at what phase of uh, disease process are we? So if you look at the disease process, there is an acute phase, there is a stabilization phase, there is a recovery phase, there is a, uh, and a phase where a patient has recovered and gained adequate amount of functional capability where we can get him out of the ventilator, what we call as the extubation phase. So the ventilation in each, when somebody is in acute phase, we are not trying to wean him or extubate him, right? So we are only going to look at the safety, safety of the lung. We are not trying to produce any, uh, we are not trying to wake him up. We are not trying to decrease the support here. Only the uh, plateau pressures less than 13, a ARDS patient, a driving pressure less than 13, 14 is what we are trying to achieve here. This safety is the goal in the acute phase. Once we come to stabilization and weaning, the pressures are already down. We are in a zone where we are more worried about comfort and liberation. That is when the modes or the uh, phases of ventilation, we change to comfort and liberation. The relative importance of the three goals are not constant. They change in time and it's always related to the disease evolution and recovery. See, here again, you have to understand when I say disease evolution and recovery, the primary focus is to correct that and always track your mechanical ventilation or keep the mechanical ventilation in sync with a disease evolution or recovery. For example, if you are ventilating a OP poisoning patient on the third, fourth day, suddenly the patient starts deteriorating. You understand the patient might be in a, a different phase of uh, intermediate uh, syndrome. Then if you try to you know, directly go and try to wean him and extubate, it doesn't happen. So understanding the disease and the evolution and the recovery of the disease and trying to match our mechanical ventilation is a good way of uh, having a good strategy in producing good uh, a lung protective mechanical ventilation. So always look at the patient, assess the patient needs, then identify the ventilator goals, then identify the treatment options. As I said, uh, the disease is the most primary, then available modes and match the technology to the patient needs. This would be the, in a nutshell what the strategies would be and let me take you through all that. So in the acute phase, what did we say? The goal is safety. So what is the objective? It is ob objective is to uh, optimize the ventilation perfusion and prevent ventilator induced lung injury, for producing lung protective ventilation. So we monitor the p plat. See, that is the capability of the ventilator. The ventilator should have the capability to, to look tell you what is the p plat, or you should have the capability to evaluate p plat, understand what p plat is, what is the driving pressure, what is the compliance. And for this mode, most of the ERDS ventilation studies are also published through volume control modes. In anesthesia also, most of us do tend to use volume controlled modes because as we are using low tidal volumes, low tidal volumes, we don't want to use pressure control modes in this scenario because here, the volume in volume control mode, volume is fixed. The pressure is the variable. So it's much easier to manage the pressure. If, the, if you make the volume, which is already low variable, then the patient may suddenly go into severe respiratory acidosis. So that is something that generally uh, is a problem in low, uh, low tidal volume ventilation. So we prefer to use volume control mode, but there is absolutely no evidence that uh, volume control is better than pressure control. Uh, even the people who have done most of the studies have used this because for the same reason. So now that we understand 
that we have to institute lung protective ventilation in acute phase. Let us understand what is lung protective ventilation, how to evaluate P-plat, what is driving pressure, and what are the values or the boundaries which constitute the lung protection, lung protective ventilation boundaries. Next three, four slides, I'll try to uh, tell you what the boundaries for lung protective ventilation are. So this is what we are going to learn in the next three, four slides. Uh, as I've said, in acute phase, the whole idea of uh, management would be to reduce the phase of this is acute phase. We have to minimize the acute stage. Then the focus again has to go to the management of the disease. That is where you have to look at the pathology. So sick CR, uh, these are some of the guidelines that generally we use in sick ARDS and COPD patients who are uh, going with low tidal volume ventilation. We generally tend to paralyze them for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but it, uh, if you are able to passively manage the patient with uh, sedation, it can be done. On control modes, preferred mode is uh, volume control. High dose of vasopressors may be required. And when patients are having hypotension in the first 24 hours, we don't tend to uh, feed them. Maybe we may have to prone them also, ARDS patients. So generally in the first 24 hours. But the continuation of neuromuscular block, block blocking drugs for a long time, too much of sedation usage, a uh, lot of uh, uh, delay in uh, nutrition, all leads to ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, ICU-acquired weakness and delirium. This has to be factored in. So if you don't prevent this at this time, then the problem comes when you are in the stabilization and in your weaning phases. But sometimes the disease may not allow us to uh, get them out, out of sedation or to feed them. So these things do happen. So I, 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 as I already told you, you should sink your mechanical ventilation and all your treatment goals to the disease evolution and the phases of the disease, how it is going. So if you lose the focus and you just concentrate on the mechanical ventilation, you are never going to get good results. So to understand lung, lung protective ventilation, you have to understand alveoli is a cul-de-sac, meaning that there's the only way that the air gets in and goes out. It's not a flow-through system. So there is a closed balloon at the end of a tube and the air has to go in and come out through the same tube. So when you put volume, when you put, and disease, all disease lung is never homogeneous. Even a normal lung is not homogeneous. The bases are collapsed because of the weight of the over, uh, the lung which is above it. And there is, there is, there is a more alveoli at the bases and it tends to collapse. So even a normal lung is not homogeneous and the diseased lung is more, not, is more, more heterogeneous. So if you, See, this is, this is something you have to understand. If a normal tidal volume is delivered, where do you expect a tidal volume to go? To this or a diseased or on the upper portions or the lower portions? Because air always chooses the path of least resistance. So, more alveoli is going to go into the alveoli which are more compliant, which are easy to expand. So, if you give a normal tidal volume in such a situation, in any diseased lung, the normal alveoli is going to get affected and the gas exchange is occurring there and the patient is surviving because of the normal alveoli. If you, if you give a normal tidal volume for the whole lung, because for example, in this CT figure, if you see, there may be hardly about 50-60 million alveoli which are really taking part in the gas exchange and you cannot give a tidal volume which is appropriated to 300 million alveoli. So, one obvious direction is you should reduce the tidal volume. So reduce the set tidal volume. This is one takeaway message that you have to take. In any diseased lung or even in a normal lung, even in anesthesia who is anesthetized and supine, the bases are collapsed. So you cannot give a normal 10 ml, 12 ml of tidal volumes. Those days are gone. The tidal volumes that we use are around 6 to 7 ml of tidal volume. And as I said, alveoli is a cul-de-sac. When you put a volume into a closed space, what increases? Pressure increases. And there are four pressures. We call it as four Ps. And I will tell you what are the four Ps. You should always, always record the four Ps at the end of, at the initiation of mechanical ventilation. You should uh, uh, enter what is the tidal volume set. And how to set the tidal volume also, I will tell you. So these two things are the most important things that you have to keep in mind to institute a lung protective ventilation. Two things, 
A disease lung or even a normal lung is not homogeneous and the disease lung is very, very heterogeneous. There is less number of alveoli which are capable of taking the volume. So you have to reduce the tidal volume. And when you put volume into a closed space, pressure increases and pressure increases more now because there are lesser alveoli. So you have to measure four piece or monitor four piece. I will tell you in the next two, three slides what they are. So understanding four piece and lung protective ventilation. See, once you do this setting in a volume control, FIO2, tidal volume, P, respiratory rate, IR ratio, do you think the same tidal volume given to these two will produce same pressure? Obviously not, isn't it? It is like looking here, look at here, both the alveoli. This has only 50 million alveoli. This has all the, this has about 150, 200 million. This is the capacitance property. So what you set is the intensive property. What the volume or the pressure you set is the intensive property. And the capacitance is the number of alveoli that are capable of accommodating that volume. When both of them interact, we get a pressure. And that is called the pressure changes. And there are four pressures. And those pressures are PIP, peak inspiratory pressure, plateau pressure, driving pressure and P. Of these two pressures are already there on the ventilator. Peak inspiratory pressure and PEEP is what you said, is already on. To get the plateau pressure and the driving pressure, you should do a maneuver on the ventilator that is called the inspiratory hold. I would say the most important button on your ventilator is the inspiratory hold button. You just hold it for two to three seconds. When the patient is in a volume controlled mode and is passive, then you get four pressures. Those are the four pressures. See, this is what you get on the ventilator. Already, the, this is this is there. This is the static pressure. This is the pressure that is there when the volume has gone through, when the volume goes through the lung. So this gets into the so this PIP is, contr is contributed by airways, alveoli, and chest wall. Right. So now we want to differentiate and see what is the contribution of the airways, what is the contribution of the alveoli, and what is the contribution of the chest wall. For that, we put an inspiratory hold. We put an inspiratory hold. See, this is what it tells us. See, PIP includes airways, PIP includes airways, alveoli, and the chest wall. By doing an inspiratory hold, we have eliminated the airway part. The difference between the P plat and the PIP is the trans airway pressure. That is the contribution of the airway. So now, once we get to know the P plat, the difference between the P plat and the PEEP is the driving pressure. And that is the pressure required to push the volume into the lung, tidal volume into the lung. So the now four pressures are there. One is PEEP, PIP, P plat. P plat comes by putting an inspiratory hold. And the difference between P plat and PEEP is the driving pressure. P, P plat includes both the alveoli and the chest wall. To, if you want to really differentiate between the contribution of the chest wall, you have to float a esophageal balloon, which is not available in most of the ventilators. It is quite expensive and it is in fact not required for every patient. It is only required for the sickest of the sick lungs. This discrimination between the lung and the chest wall is mostly done by clinical assessment. For example, if you are operating a laparoscopic patient and if the patient after pneumoperitoneum develops or if the pressures goes up, the PIP goes up, then you should know it is mostly because of the decrease in the diaphragm getting down. So the pressures have gone up intrathoracically. So you can clinically know that it is not because of the alveolar issue. So clinically, most of the times we can make out, but in the sickest of the sick cases where the centers have too much of ARDS load, it is wise to have a esophageal balloon. Uh, many ventilators do have the prov provision. Uh, your Hamilton ventilator also comes with this option where you can float in and you can look at the pleural pressure. The difference between the lung and the pleural pressure is the contribution of the called the transpulmonary pressure that is only contributed by the lung. Anything additional to that will always be because of the chest wall. So this is the most important thing, the takeaway message of this one strategy that you have to employ across all patients is a reduced tidal volume setting. The reduced tidal volume setting for a normal lung would be between 6 to 7 ml. In a ARDS lung, we will go between 5 to 7 ml. 
This is the tile volume settings that we do. So, 6 to 7, 7, 7 ml of the predicted body weight. Look at the example here now. See, then I, I'll give you an example also. And you, it is always according to the predicted. Never ever guess somebody's weight. It is criminal to guess somebody's weight. And then, see, now we are setting to the appropriate to the patient's height. But we are not setting it to the appropriate number of alveoli that are present in the lung. Then you have to, starting point is to the predicted body weight. That is for the capacity of the lung, normal capacity of the lung. Then you have to fine tune the tile volume looking at the P plant and driving pressure, which is to the number of compliant alveoli. I hope I am very clear to that. And this is the formula. So it is there. Uh, if you want, I can send the slides also and doctor, you can collect it from Dr. Johnson. So the whole idea is, it is a reduced tile volume. The starting point is seven and you can go up to six. In ARDS, you can go up to five and in rare cases, we do go up to four, but those patients rarely survive. That is when you go beyond less than four, the patient has to go to ECMO. So that is the starting point. And from there, the fine tuning is with P-plat and driving pressure. I've told you how to get the P-plat and driving. I'll tell you the numbers in the next subsequent slides. So 50-year-old female patient posted for uh, lap coli, BMI of 30, hypertension, diabetes. How do you start mechanical ventilation? So, okay, these are your settings. Now, the patient is 100 kgs and the uh, predicted body weight is 165. Do you set it for 100 kgs or for 165 centimeters? See, if you set it for 100 kgs, it will be 700 ml. But the patient just requires 385 ml. I hope I'm clear. The lung size doesn't improve. The lung doesn't become big as you become bigger. If you become from 50 kgs to 100 kgs, the, the size of your heart, heart may double. Heart may become, it may not double it. Heart becomes dilated. You may go into dilated cardiomyopathy, but your lung and kidneys don't really double in your size. So you always put it to the height of the patient. Then fine tune with the four piece. So understanding the lung protective ventilation boundaries. In a normal lung, these are the boundaries. A P plat of less than 16, a driving pressure of less than 13, a PEEP of uh, 5 to 10, and PIP generally will be around 20 in a normal lung. Whereas if you look at the ERDS patient, the P plat should be around less than 28, a, P, uh, a driving pressure less than 15, and a PEEP of 10 to 15, even in rare cases, we go up to 20 centimeters. So what I want you to understand is that once you do the setting, if the lung is normal, say when we are operating a patient with uh, a normal caesarean, patient goes into PPH and goes into massive transfusion, develops trolley. You may be looking and starting with a P plate of 16 and 13. In intraoperatively, you may have to move it to 28 and 15 because the lung has deteriorated. But beyond that, if somebody is going beyond this, the mortalities will be very high. So only way to keep the P plate less than 28 is to keep producing the tile volume. One most important thing that you have to manage is the tile volume, tile volume, tile volume. That is, and most of all the studies across the board have proven that the tile volume uh, reduction decreases the mortality. And also moderate, moderate peep, moderate peep of 5 to 10 in the normal lung and 10 to 15 in air. Most of the cases can be managed with 10 to 15 pressure peep. So, the starting boundary and the maximum boundary. In a ARDS patient in an ICU, you may start with this, but in an intraoperative situation, most of the times you may be doing, suddenly patient deteriorates, we may be looking at a maximum boundary. So now that we have understood the trial volume has to be less and we understand the boundaries and the pressures to look at, this is all that you have to understand to provide safety in the acute phase of the uh, disease process. If you have any queries, I would um, uh, not uh, mind pausing here and going through and uh, repeating one or two slides because this is what you have to understand. If uh, it is okay, we'll uh, do discuss at the end of the talk. And when the maximum boundaries are crossed, probably we have only one option and ECMO. Uh, with COVID, ECMO has become very, very uh, common knowledge even to a common man. 
Uh, when you say patient is sick, they'll ask, uh, shall we do ECMO? They don't understand the intricacies and the cost involved. So in the stabilization phase and recovery phase, weaning and ext extubation cannot be accomplished by turning a few buttons on a ventilator or by using advanced modes. That you have to clearly understand. What you have to understand is primary disease correction and preventing any decrease in the functional capacity because of your drugs, because of your maneuvers, because of your improper mechanical ventilation or uh, development of any disease associated process like delirium or AKI. This is where you have to concentrate. Ventilator is just trying to keep the patient stable and you, when you sync it with the the functional capacity and the disease evolution, you will always never go wrong. So what is the goal here? It is safety and comfort. We optimize, again, safety has to be there, but most of the we try to put them on spontaneous ventilation, avoid asynchrony, minimize the sedation, inspiratory effort enhancement, and most of the modes here used are pressure support, NAVA, volume support, assistive or adaptive support, ventilation or proportional assist ventilation. One thing, kindly remember, don't feel that all these modes are different. All these modes are based on pressure support. All these modes, NAVA is based on pressure support, adaptive support, ventilation, the delivery uh, method is pressure support, proportional assist is pressure support. Only thing is, except NAVA and proportional assist ventilation, no other mode is physiologically better. They are better in the sense that they make the life of the intensivist easy because it is better than human settings, not physiologically better. Those are the only two modes. To a small extent, adaptive support ventilation also comes into that category, which are physiologically better. I will not get into that, but you can remember that if you have a pressure support, most of the work can be done there. So when I say advanced modes, I have seen most of the junior colleagues get really bogged down thinking that it's something different. It is nothing. There are only four modes or five modes in mechanical ventilation. Volume control, assist volume control, pressure control, assist volume control, assist pressure control, and pressure support ventilation. And if you give a set point or a target, and then you a advanced mode targeting scheme becomes an advanced mode. And you can remember this, 90% of your advanced modes are based on pressure support. Why? Because pressure support is the only mode where two phases, triggering and cycling are controlled by the patient. Triggering and the four flow cycling is managed by the patient. So most of the advanced modes, you name most of the 90% of the advanced modes are based on pressure support ventilation. So in stabilization phase, Along with the disease management and, and uh, preventing any uh, uh, decrease in the physiological reserve, which may be because of ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, ICU acquired weakness or delirium. So this is all about prevention. And uh, you should remember, God has created diaphragm not to rest at all. Even if it rests for a minute or two minutes or three minutes, we are going to increase our carbon dioxide and stimulate the breathing, right? So you cannot keep it quiet for days together and it is it doesn't know how to keep quiet and if you keep quiet it leads into ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction and it is more common in age sick patients longer duration MODS so ICU acquired these are some of the causes very very common and delirium also these are the common uh, all this can lead to delirium and this is how you manage the delirium. So here it is all about prevention one being cognizant to the fact that this may occur and now the two other factors that you have to consider is how to prevent them. Each one requires a R stock. So I will not get into that. I've just stimulated you to go back and read these things and understand what is VI, DD, ICU acquired weakness and delirium. So this is the most important bundle that every ICU in this country should implement. A, B, C, D, E, F bundle. This bundle is what is going to keep your keep the functional reserve of the patient very, very intact and make the weaning much more easier. So ABCD, ABCD EF bundle is the bundle that every ICO has to implement. So what does it constitute? A constitutes to awake, meaning that you don't paralyze and sedate for a long time, breathing coordination, then uh, always try to go for a, contemplate whether the patient can be weaned, can be given a TP trial. So A, 
comes A B comes there. Then uh, C is choose light sedation. We avoid benzodiazepines because we know that uh, benzodiazepines do cause delirium. Then D is delirium on ma management, monitoring and management. E is early, early mobility and exercise and occupational therapy. This is the most neglected. E is the most neglected. And F is nutrition and family engagement. There is a lot of uh, issues with family engagement. I have seen that uh, many ICUs are too rigid. They have one hour, two hours time in the morning and evening. I do understand that there is a lot of logistic issues people do tend to. But if they, there are every patient is different. Somebody may be emotionally very disturbed, may require a family person to stay with them. So that has to be a family uh, visitation. Policy has to be established in every ICU. I find I, I uh, would suggest that that part also has to be taken into consideration in ABCD EF bundle. So these are some of the diaphragmatic protective ventilation. I said that the muzzle that God doesn't want you to keep quiet. So minimize control ventilation, moderate peep, avoid over resistance or under resistance, avoid asynchronous early beaning and extubation is the best to keep the diaphragm working on its own. So nutrition. Don't think nutrition is only for calories. Nutrition prevents immune paralysis and for gut health. Gut is healthy only when the nutrition is there, internal nutrition is there. Gut is the motor for sepsis. So don't think nutrition is only for calories. So it is also prevents immune paralysis and gut is the motor for sepsis. Gut health is of paramount importance. Start early, gradual step up, low protein, then step up, isosmolar feeds and GRV, we don't do any checking unless there is uh, uh, really a issue which warrants uh, any rail strip suction or any abdominal distension. We generally don't check. Even if we do check, we do, we do with a ultrasound nowadays. So physical and occupational therapy is something which is very, very neglected in the ICUs. We have started making patients sick with ventilators. We are trying to make them walk with the ventilators now. So you don't think that physical therapy is only for uh, uh, patients who are out of ventilator. Studies have shown that nutrition with physical therapy prevents muzzle loss. See, the, the size of the muzzle decreases if there is no physical therapy, even if you give adequate nutrition. That's what the statement means. So physical therapy and nutrition should go hand in hand. If somebody is not able to sit or uh, sit or uh, move on their own, the physiotherapist uh, has to do it and uh, the mobility has to be maintained. The inspiratory muscle training also is very important uh, given how it has to be done. This valve is available on Amazon for a few thousand rupees. You can buy it's a peep valve where you can do a pre-operative training and post-operative if the surgery is a long duration surgery in elderly patients and uh, passive for uh, therapy for uncaseous patient positioning tilting up with arm support, tilting up with uh, arm unsupported. These are some of the physical therapies. See, the patient in the figure is walking and never ever forget occupational therapy. This occupational therapy, sleep are very, very important to prevent delirium. They don't have orientation to time and place and it's a alien atmosphere. So there has to be a standard operating procedure for them to wear their spexes. They can read papers, they can hear music and a person who's a social worker can come, come and spend some time. There are a lot of people who are very keen to come and work in hospitals. So then going into weaning. So any premature weaning also is risky. Uh, delayed weaning also has its own set of risks. I will not go into it. It's quite obvious. So here, what you have to uh, do is, the, you have to, the, the most important thing the studies have shown that is, the suspicion for weaning, we always say that patient is not ready for weaning. So you have to be suspicious every day. And the pressure support and PEEP need not, need not be 10 and 5 for giving a spontaneous breathing trial. If the disease evolution and the patient's hemodynamic condition is there, very good. You can give a weaning uh, a TP trial even with a slightly higher PEEP and uh, pressure support also. So that is suspicion and weaning trials or something that has to be assessed every day and you need not go with numbers. You have to clinically assess and a commonsensical uh, uh, approach is much important than looking at your uh, rapid shallow breathing index and all your gases. So weaning trials, TPs, pressure support and SMV, we don't use SMV nowadays. The studies have shown that it is not good for weaning. 
So it is between TPs and uh, pressure support. How do you d- decide between pressure support or uh, directly going into TPCs? If there is a 20-year-old healthy cholecystectomy, I would directly extubate from a PEEP of even 10. But 60-year-old uh, COPD, diabetic hypertension, EF of 40, bilateral pneumonia, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. So I would give a TPS trial. Even the time, generally after 30 minutes of uh, pressure support or a TPS trial, we would extubate. But in a patient with uh, this kind of a scenario where the functional reserve capacity, functional capacity was less, and because of the disease and treatment, it may have become even lesser. A TP trial of around one to one and a half hours probably would be ideal before you take a decision to extubate. That's a standard protocol that we follow in our unit. But every unit can have a SOP of their own. And about 15 to 20% of reintubation in a high a turnover unit is acceptable. So you should not be fearing a reintubation and continuing patients for a longer duration on mechanical ventilation. So weaning failure, always think there is an unresolved pathology and new issues like a ventilator-associated pneumonia. So the load and capacity are not matching. The commonest thing is anxiety, pain and fever. These are easy to correct. Some difficult situations will be always see any weaning failure, you should always look at your heart. That's the commonest reason for weaning failure because weaning is a cardiac stress test. Once you go for a spontaneous breathing, preload increases because negative pressure brings up a lot of volume into the lung, then the heart may go into failure. So cardiac old age, COPD, a reduced functional reserve like a COVID fibrosis. It would be obvious, no? It be, we tend to understand. If the CT continues to be showing white patches for a long time, no fever, we understand patient might have had fibrosis and we will be going for a tracheostomy and a long-term care facility. So all this has to be considered. So some of the tips for difficult to wean and extubate patients is cardiac assessment. Uh, I would We generally tend to start with a very small dose of dobutamine, keep the fluid balance neutral or negative, small dose of fentanyl and paracetamol before extubation probably may allow us to extubate the marginal patients. Not every patient if the uh, ejection fractions are very low, but in the marginal patients, these three maneuvers, small dose of dobutamine, negative fluid balance, and a small dose of fentanyl and paracetamol before extubation does help. So some of the issues of uh, extubation would be so these are the criteria, conscious, well-oriented, comfortable, hemodynamically stable. The, this is very easy to evaluate on a ventilator. You can ask the patient to cough and you can look at the peak flows. If the flows are more than 60 liters per minute. He has a good uh, cough flow. And more than 60, they generally give a clue, subject, a kind of an objective clue that the patient may tolerate extubation better. And these are some of the commonly looked at uh, criteria. So these are some of the additional information that are available on the newer ventilators, P01, uh, which tells the respiratory dike, uh, what is the respiratory drive? The P1, P01, which is normally uh, around three to four, is more than six, seven. Then the primary pathology or whatever reason, the drive is too high. When you try to extubate such kind of a patients, probably you may go into extubation failure. When you see such numbers, you always go back and look at your what is happening at the primary pathology, what is the decrease in the functional reserve, what has to be done, correct it, stay for a day, then bring the P01 to 3 to 5 and then go for a extubation. And even this is very easy, maximum negative inspiratory capacity that can be done even before extubation in a long duration surgery also. Put a trigger on a pressure support to minus 20 or minus 30. If the patient is able to trigger a breath, that means he is able to generate a negative expiratory pressure of minus 20 or 30. Generally, we don't do but in case if somebody is interested, they can do. But all that we do is head holding. Then we look at top secretions, hand grip strength and uh, mentation. And then we go for an extubation. As I said, a commonsensical approach would work most of the times. When you are finding difficult to extubation, difficult to wean, these are the things that you can additionally look, which are there already in your ventilator. Only knowing where to look makes the patient much more um, safer. And you be, we are in a safer boat. So there is another uh, thing also the younger colleagues have to make a, discri- a discrimination between weaning difficulty and extubation difficulty. They are different. Look at the two examples. 20-year-old road traffic accident, GCS of 6. This guy may be 
on a tea piece with tracheostomy on the second day or third day or probably a week once the cerebral edema decreases there is definitely no difficulty in weaning this but it is very difficult to extubate because he is not able to protect the airway whereas look at this example this guy has a good mentation but his functional reserve is so poor this guy may be having both weaning and extubation difficulties and uh, remember copd with smoking patients probably extubation on to a niv would be a good option so take home thought should be understanding four p's boundaries of lung protective ventilation low vt is a single important parameter to prevent uh, vili a 5 to 8 tidal volume start with predicted body weight fine tune with p plat and driving pressures permissible hypoxia hypercarbia atelectasis to prevent vili is acceptable implement abcd bundle but never in the risk of repetition i'm saying correct the primary pathology that is what is going to kill or save your patient not what we do with abcd or whatever so primary pathology focus on you never lose focus on primary pathology management the trajectory and the uh, recovery all these things of the primary pathology are most important thank you thank you sir for your wonderful presentation and the widely cover the management of ventilatory management in icu rightly said the nutritional support and the physiotherapy is important parcel of ventilatory management for going into the questions i have my few questions sir a ventilatory management of the anesthesia suppose it, we are taking a case of laparoscopic surgery we said lung protective ventilation suppose we are going to reduce the tidal volume to 6 ml 5 ml If there is a hypercarbia, can we increase the respiratory rate, or we have to adjust the inspiratory time, sir? I would increase the respiratory rate. Okay. So we need not adjust the air issues. Oh, ultimately, we are putting more minute ventilation. Uh, if you increase the rate, carbon dioxide will come out. Okay, sir. So we will go to the questions on the chat box, sir. So you said uh, nowadays VCV is the preferred over PCV versus so upper ventilation. But is there any advantage of PCV over VCV in any situation? Sir? Pressure controlled ventilation has a decelerating kind of a flow, whereas a volume controlled has a fixed flow. Volume control can only be used in a patient who is passive, whereas a pressure controlled uh, uh, flow pattern can be used in a patient who is uh, spontaneously breathing because it, it it mimics the normal breathing. So I would use volume controlled as long as the patient is passive. Once the patient wakes up, I would always go with the pressure control. That means I have gone out of the acute phase. I am going into this stabilization phase. In stabilization phase, it is always pressure control. In volume control, is only for the acute phase. Okay. The second question is also related to that. Questions. Advantage of decelerating flow over constant flow. The constant flow is we don't breathe with a constant flow. See, whenever we breathe, we try to hit the maximum flows and then start decelerating. That's how we breathe. because we don't breathe with a constant flow but the advantages of a constant flow is you can apply p plat and the measurements are more accurate in a constant flow because the flow is constant in a decelerating flow the estimation of p plat and uh, your uh, driving pressures are not accurate so that my suggestion is in acute phase always a volume control would be much easier to handle because we are already using lower tidal volumes and if you go in a mode with a tidal volume in a pressure control mode with 5 ml and if the lung deteriorates the tidal it itself adjusts the tidal volume to 3 ml and if you are not very uh, alert the patient may go into a pco2 of 200 in a ards patient because there you have set the set pressure say if i have set the pressure at 20 cm once this flow it's 20 cm the flow stops if the lung is bad the pressure it's very faster so the deliver tidal volume is much lesser whereas in volume control irrespective of whatever happens the set volume is delivered the pressure increases you can set a alarm the alarm beeps and you can go and check it you said uh, you have to use a light sedation in the icu suppose the patient is uh, having a endotracheal tube how to you um, tolerance You have to go for a higher uh, sedation or lower sedation. 
No, I didn't say light sedation. Light sedation is the goal, but each sedation is dependent on the patient. Some people don't require any sedation at all. They tolerate the tube. Some people do require sedation. So it is uh, patient dependent. But the goal is to minimize, even for the patient who is very very restless, to minimize. So keep the lowest. Don't try to knock them off so that you you are comfortable. We call that as nurses' nighttime sedation. As as the nurse wants to sleep, she'll paralyze and sedate everybody. In the morning, everybody will have hundred saturation, but everybody gets into ICU acquired quickness or VIDD. So that's not the way. The goal is to use the minimum for minimum acceptable or minimum possible sedation for each patient, because sedation causes delirium, and we don't use benzodiazepines nowadays. Our choice would be propofol, narcotics, propofol, and dex. dex. Are the three drugs that we commonly use in our ICU nowadays. Another question is: Can we put spontaneous breathing patients in assisted VC mode? No, no. That's what I said. It has a constant flow. So whenever the first breath patient takes, it is better to go into a assist pressure control. Uh, what is the permissible atlect atlectasis? You said permissible atlectasis. What do you mean by that? Sir? Permissible atlectasis is. I don't want. See, I can have a saturation of hundred even in a ARDS patient if I use the FiO two of hundred a peep of thirty. I don't want to do that. I want the sick lung to be collapsed. The sick lung starts opening up only when the sepsis or the pneumonia goes when my antibiotics work. So I will open up the lung to a saturation of ninety. The rest of the lung which I have allowed to sleep or be quiet is permissible at elective. Did that uh, alveoli interest? Yes. Meaning, no, I don't want to open it because I am aware of the fact that I am not looking at a saturation of ninety. See, if you look at the oxygen content, the oxygen content is thousand, and the ODC curve is flat uh, with a, has a S shape. Once be, between a saturation of ninety to hundred, the delivered oxygen doesn't change to the mitochondria. So, what is the point in pushing it from ninety to hundred when the lung is sick? So my idea is, once I reach a saturation of 92, I know the delivery of oxygen is assured for the mitochondria, and there is no energy failure. If at all, if the energy failure is occurring, it is because of endotoxic elements that are going and damaging the mitochondria, not the oxygen delivery, and that has to be managed with antibiotics, not with ventilation. So ventilation goal is achieved once the saturation crosses 90. And you should not push it because it doesn't give additional advantage, and it also leads to VIL. So in uh, COPD patients in ICU, should we need to increase respiratory rate or IE IE ratio? I would always increase the IE ratio if it is in a controlled ventilation. But how do you increase the IE ratio when the patient is in a pressure support? It doesn't work in pressure support. We always tend to decrease the pressure support so that the tidal volume delivered is six or seven mL. Then increase the uh, rise time and increase the uh, expiratory trigger sensitivity. I have a recorded uh, talk in the same channel. If you a year back, you can go back and refer to it. Thank you very much, sir. There is no more questions in the chat box. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation of ventilator uh, management in ICU. We have to look into our old uh, lectures also to understand uh, most of the. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The old lectures are available in our uh, YouTube channels, and uh, viewers can go through that. I will, I will send these slides to Dr. Johnson. If anybody is interested, they can take and go through. If you have any doubts, you can contact me. I'll try to sort it out. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Sunny, sir. Thank you, Sandra, sir, sir. Thank you for a wonderful session today, and also I thank uh, Sir Prasad Sir for coordinating this session. Thank you, Sunny Sir. We will meet uh, in the future also. Uh, Sandra Sir, Sir, we will meet in future also, Sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, Sir. Bye, Sir. Uh, thank you, the host uh, A1 Logics, the uh, Zakrula A1 Logics, and uh, the Anastasia TV. Thank you. We will meet next week, next month, with a uh, more interesting topic. Thank you once again. Have a good day, sir. Thank you very much. Good day.